I'd like you all to close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood, as far back as you can go, and think about a time where you needed physical comfort. Maybe you fell off your bike and scraped your knees, or you got your little finger stuck in the car door. Maybe your best friend told you that they were going to move far away. It could be something positive. You might have raced home to tell your family that you got your first day on an exam. You can open your eyes. Similar things might have come up for you. A hug, holding hands, a high five. If you were my two-year-old, you would say snuggle cozy. But you don't have to study developmental psychology to have a foundation of understanding that physical touch is very important to children. Of course, it has been studied, and those studies show that children have an innate biological need for physical touch, and it's called contact comfort. It's just as important as food, shelter, and clothing. So it might surprise you to learn that there is a population of children right now in the United States who are away from their families, their communities, and locked indoors in a traumatic environment. And those are the children who are in inpatient psychiatric care. Now, before we can talk about what happens to kids in psychiatric care, we have to talk about who these children are. And you might think, well, those are probably kids who have severe mental ailments, right? The first time an adolescent has a manic episode, uh, someone who's hearing voices, someone who's suicidal or homicidal, and absolutely, those children are there. But that is not a clear representation of the entire population. So in 1979, the Supreme Court ruled that to involuntarily commit a child, they only needed to have one parent or caregiver and one agreeing staff member. What does that mean? Well, unfortunately, some insurance companies only will pay for treatment if the child goes into inpatient care, even for minor ailments. That means that parents can be forced to commit their child to get them the help they need, even if outpatient community-based care would be more effective. We also have to talk about this word caregiver. Caregiver could be a state, any state in the US. Let's say a child's parents die, and there's no other person to take care of them. Or they're abused in foster care, or they run away from a group home. These are all reasons that the state can say, let's temporarily place the child here until we can find a more permanent placement. Now, I don't mean short term as in a long weekend stay. This could be a week, a month, many months, a year. And it can seem like an eternity to the child. That information helps a study make sense. It was a national study in 2002 looking at 20,586 inpatient children and adolescents. And of those, 10,897 of them had no diagnosable mental health disorder. That's basically half. Now, the caveat to this is that psychiatrists can struggle, right, with diagnosing young children with a psychiatric disorder. So perhaps that's a bit inflated. However, in that exact study, there were 515 children who were between the ages of 0 and 2, and 1,093 children between the ages of 3 and 5. I am part of that statistic. Uh, statistic excuse me. When I was 12 years old, I was living in a very toxic living environment with my family. We did not have what in psychology we call a goodness of fit, and there were many times that I did not feel safe in my own home. And it became so bad that the state had to remove me in hopes that my parents and I could get the intensive family therapy that we needed to mend our family unit. And so I was placed temporarily into psychiatric care. Now I'm 12, I've never heard of a psychiatric hospital, I don't know what a mental illness is. I have no idea what I'm going to get myself into. The first night I'm there, there is a 15-year-old girl. She's about seven months pregnant. And I listen to her. She's down the hall. She's in restraint. And she is screaming for six hours that her baby is dying. And I look at my roommate and I'm saying, why, why is nobody going to go check on this girl and her unborn child? She did not actually get taken to the hospital until the next morning. She never came back. But I was told, and I learned very quickly, that unless I wanted to end up like her, I was to say and do nothing. 
I was in a very unique situation. So a school bus picked me up every day of the week, drove me 45 minutes to my school, I had classes, and I went back to the hospital. I was there nights and weekends, but I still saw a lot of things, and I met a lot of kids. So I did meet children who had psychiatric disorders. I met one girl with bipolar one disorder. She had hot pink hair and rainbow bright pants that she made herself. I thought she was the coolest. And one day we were sitting in the hallway talking about why we're there. And she rolls up her sleeve, and she was a, she, she was a more curvilicious girl. And she showed me that she had lifted up the skin and fat of her arms and had cut it out in chunks with scissors. I'm 12. I don't know how to process that. And no point at intake am I told that I might see and hear things that I might find disturbing and how to handle those things. I met children who did not have a psychiatric disorder. While I was there, there were three four-year-olds, two boys and a girl. And one boy, we'll call him Kay, he was there because his parents had died. And his grandmother was in a legal battle with the state to have custody of him. The state thought she felt that she was too old and she did not have a proper living environment for him. And when I got to the hospital, he'd already been there for six months. It was a very slow going process. Well, one night I woke up and so did the other adolescent girls and we heard Kay screaming. Now I'll be honest, at this point, hearing a kid screaming, that's an everyday occurrence. It was abnormal not to hear that happen or see kids restrained. <sighs> We look, we see Kay being taken out in a stretcher, and the next day we find out what happened. There was another uh, boy there, he was an adolescent, he was 17 years old, we'll call him G. Uh, G had tics, he had Tourette's, he, had, uh, he was hearing voices, he was a very disturbed young man, and he had snuck into Kay's room and raped him. Kay came back a few days later, and he was so traumatized he could not be around male staff members or any other male patients. And he also could not receive contact comfort because when you are a child in psychiatric care, you must be arm's length. It is a rule where you need to be arm's length from all other children at all times and staff members. So he couldn't get those hugs that he needed. And we just had to see him process what had happened to him. Well. There is actually one time where children can be touched, and that is when they are physically restrained. So physically restraining older child is literally just that. They're going to be put into a restraint bed. But if you're a child uh, below the age of 10, you're too small for a restraint bed. And so they do something. It can be called blanketing in some places, where they put a restraint blanket on the floor. They push the child to the floor with their head uh, uncovered their arms to their sides, and then they roll them up like a little tostita. And then the staff workers lift up the child and carry them usually into a quiet room, that's a room with nothing in it, and they'll be locked in there sometimes for a long time. Now the being locked in the room part, that's not fun. But let's think about what I was saying earlier. If a young child has this need for physical comfort, they're removed from their loved ones, and they're not getting what they need. Well now they're pairing a behavior right, with getting that physical touch, providing positive reinforcement that if they keep exhibiting that behavior, that they're going to be held, right? They're going to be wrapped in that blanket. And I can tell you, I've seen little kids restrained. I've seen them being lifted, lifted up into the air like it's an amusement park ride, right? Like big smiles, like, whoa, this is fun. They laugh, they think it's hilarious. The Children's Mental Health Act of 2000 said that children should not be placed into restraints unless they are a danger to themselves or others, and immediately following that, they should be taken out. But I've seen four-year-olds being restrained because they were fighting over if they were going to watch Teletubbies or Barney, right? Stomping their little feet, I'm so mad, throwing a tantrum, no mental health worker coming over to talk to them and seeing what's going on, how to resolve that issue, instead blanketing them. Now, I was restrained one time in the hospital. My parents came to visit me. So they came to visit me, and uh, I was very ballsy. And I asked them if I could come home on a weekend pass. It was not really to hang out with them. I wanted to go home and see a whole concert. Uh, and I just wanted to be a kid for a weekend and go have fun with my friends. But I was met with an authoritarian no but I really want to go. No. 
And I was so mad. I was so mad that I left the room and I went into my bedroom and I slammed a door. Now, how many of you have ever been upset and have slammed a door or kicked something? Right? It happens. The next thing I know, I turn and there's a mental health worker standing in the doorway asking me to walk to the restraint room. And I know that that means they're there asking me to willingly go and lie in a restraint bed and be restrained. And I start to panic. I don't need to be restrained. I say no. And then there's seven mental health workers in the room and a semicircle around me giving me one more opportunity to walk to the restraint room. And I say no. My legs are kicked from under me so that I fall to the ground. My head hit the headboard of the bed, and I was dragged, screaming and crying. Please stop. I'm so sorry. I did not mean to slam a door. Please stop. I was in the bed for hours just crying, feeling very violated that nobody had really talked to me and that they had done this to me. And when I came out, I can tell you, I really needed some contact comfort, right? I needed a hug, and I wasn't going to get it. And there was a girl there, and she knew how much I loved her stuffed tiger, that she gave that to me to keep, and I still have it today. So why does that happen? Why are kids restrained? Maybe not necessarily when they should be restrained. There's a couple reasons, and one of them that I'll share with you today is to be a mental health worker, some do have degrees, but a lot of them just have a GED or high school diploma. So you have people, so a mental health worker, I should tell you, they work with a child for eight-hour shifts. They wake up the kids. They check on them every 15 minutes to make sure they're safe. They read them a bedtime story. They put them to bed. This is the main caregiver of kids in psychiatric hospitals, and yet many of them have no education in abnormal psychology or childhood development. They come in with their stigmas, and their fear of what working in a psychiatric hospital means, what mental illness is, and they can react in the moment. Now, for me, this ended well in the fact that I was physically okay afterwards. But for the children whose names you see on the board behind me, they all died while being physically restrained by mental health workers in psychiatric hospitals. From Orlina, who was sat on by six mental health workers and crushed and died within 15 minutes. There was a little girl whose face was shoved into a beanbag. She suffocated and died, and mental health workers walked away without checking her pulse, did not even know she was dead. A little boy, Randy, who got really upset when he couldn't find his teddy bear, was restrained for an hour and a half, refused his asthma medication, asphyxiated, and died. Children dying from cardiac arrest, Children dying from suffocation. Uh, one boy, Matthew, who died from pneumonia, blood poisoning, and respiratory distress because he was left in mechanical restraints for 16 months. These are all children going to a hospital. If we're talking about a children's hospital right now with flowers painted on the wall, all the positivity, right? We don't hear stories like this. And then as soon as we talk about a mental illness, something changes. These are children in a place of healing, dying that don't need to. And these are specific children who have died in recent years. And why we know about them is because their parents were brave enough to share their stories. All these children have been in the news and their local papers with pictures of them. But there's a lot of parents that still have shame and stigma that their child was even there that don't share their stories. And there are children like me who leave and are scared to share their story and what others might think of them. So what can you do? We need policy to make sure that uh, children who don't have psychiatric disorders are not being involuntarily committed unless they have a psychiatric disorder that needs, that needs help. We need research on alternative treatments. We also need a re-evaluation of the arm's length rule for these kids. There needs to be enforcement of better treatment policies. There are some policies, but just nobody's enforcing them. We need required education of all mental health workers who are working with kids. We need people to consider working with these kids as mental health workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, a custodian. 
we need people to work in psychiatric hospitals who know that this is a problem and will do something about it. You need to change the conversation. It's hard to change, really, a conversation when you're not having it. When's the last time you talked about child mental health? When's the last time you talked about a psychiatric hospital in a comfortable, healthy way? For me, I'm out there trying to make that change and starting the Locket Project, a nonprofit, a place for children to share their stories of what's happening to them, and a place for families to go to get the resources of how to make sure their child is being properly taken care of. And what I want to leave you with today is that these are all kids, all ages, all states, right? All socioeconomic backgrounds, gender, sex, sexual, or, sorry, sexual orientation. And it can happen to anyone, right? Children who do and don't have a mental illness. So if this had been your friend, your grandchild, your niece or nephew, if this was your child, if this was you, because my story could have been your story, and you were in a psychiatric hospital, would you want the one time that you're touched to, when, to be when you're physically restrained? Or would you want to receive contact comfort? Thank you. <laughs>